and I have some questions for you before we start. Um, what do you consider bullying? When you think of somebody being bullied, what do you consider it being? What activities do you consider it being? Just shout it out. Making fun of. Okay. So like name calling? Teasing. Teasing. Harassment. Pushing, Pushing around. Okay, what else? Sexual harassment. Okay, that's a good one. Sexual harassment? Anything the meaning? The meaning? Okay. All right. That hurts character? Okay. You are correct. Bullying is someone that hits, kicks, grabs, or so shoves you on purpose. It's a student that threatens or teases you in a hurtful way, just like you said. Um, it's a student that tries to keep others from being your friend or from letting you join in from what they are doing. So this is something that's very common in our schools. It may not be physically doing something, but they're socially isolating them. And um, it is not bullying when two students of about the same strength argue or fight. I disagree with this uh, majorly, but this was all of these statistics are actually from the U.S. Department of Health and Safety. And, I mean, I think any of those actions, no matter what size they are, is considered bullying, but they say no. Next question, how many people have ever been bullied in their life, ever? Okay, almost probably, sometime in their life. It's okay, right. Almost everyone in here, in some way. And then, what do you think is the average amount a student bullies a peer? Is it never? Is it once a week? Is it once or twice a week? Or is it more than twice a week? Try like more ten more times twice. a day. More than twice a week? Okay. Who else? Does anybody else? Does everybody agree on that? Okay. Um, to be considered a bully, a student bullies appear more than once or twice a week. So, I mean, even though it may happen three or four times a week, if you do it once or twice, no matter it just be saying something, the name calling, you are considered a bully, um, according to... So the government actually defines... Yes, they did. The they bully. said, if, if, if this is what you do, then you are a bully. So, so it's like, I only did it once this week, so I'm not a bully. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And we'll get to that. I mean, there's an issue with that. But they say it. I mean, if you shove someone kiddingly, they even say, hey, you're a bully. So it depends. Okay. <laughs> the National Institute of Child and Health and Safety developed a survey. And this survey is, I just gave you an overview of what it is. And it's used in two of the articles that I'll explain to you that did a really in-depth study about if students consider themselves bullies, like you were mentioning, or if it's the school considering you a bully. Um, it identifies bullies, and it questions the prevalence among today's youth. And it's reported, it was conducted in 2003, so it's a relatively recent survey. And approximately 1.7 million children in grades 6 through 8 admitted to bullying classmates. So they openly admitted and said, yeah, I do this. And 10% of those students reported to bully only sometimes, and 9% of bullying once a week or more, which again would be considered a bully. And they survey show that bullying occurred at similar levels in both urban, rural, and suburban areas. So it's about equal across the board, no matter where you were at. Bullying facts, these are also from the Department of Health and Safety. When a child is bullied, it can occur through a verbal attack, which somebody mentioned, the name calling. The physical attacks, um, emotional attacks, which would have been um, the seclusion, not letting people join, that is both a social and emotional attack, and as Nathan mentioned, a sexual attack. And children, when you ask them, they said, what is bullying? Just like I asked you, they said, it's an intentional, repeated acts, words, or other abusive acts, is what they said it was. And again, common ones are name calling, threatening, and shunning. Um, more facts, it often leads to other violent behaviors in adolescents. Um, statistics show over 75% of adolescents have been bullied at some time in their school careers, so almost everybody in here raised their hand, it's not uncommon. 75% um, ranging from grammar school all the way up through college, it's happened sometime probably to someone. Most students who have been bullied suffer from low self-esteem, as kind of what Kayla mentioned about obesity, this is also another thing that they're being bullied for, and um, depression well into adulthood, which Kayla also did. Um, bullying is considered child abuse. They say if you're bullied at home, if you're being bullied by other people, if teachers are doing it, it's child abuse. Um, effects on the vi victims, if you notice this, you have students that have headaches a lot, they're not sleepy, and they have a lot of anxiety. PTSD, it's post-traumatic stress disorder. So they consider this a traumatic event in students' lives, so that's why they're associating this. Um, it does become a habit. People say, oh, you can do it once, but it does. It does become a habit. People repeatedly do it, and they think it's fun, and then it turns into these violent acts. Um, school counselors need to be aware of this in their schools, and this is a way that they're advocating that maybe they get a whole school involved, and they advocate a violence prevention program in the school, which could be even be character education in the schools. Um, male bullying is more prevalent. Um, the studies that I did will show that. 
And bullying in elementary school leads to college bullying, so when they start in elementary school, it's not stopped, schools are going through it, and they continue to do it in college. Um, it's indirect and direct bullying. Indirect bullying directly is doing it to their face, saying name calling, shunning, hitting, kicking. Social isolation can sometimes be considered an indirect bullying because it may not be directly said to the student. Um, it can take place in physical bullying, as I said, hitting or kicking, verbal as name calling or teasing, intimidation or social exclusion, so even if you're physically intimidating a student, that is considered emotional bullying, and technology is a problem. Cyberbullying, it takes place over the computer, it's not just physically to your face, and I believe somebody mentioned that. Uh, yeah, you did, on the computers about the social babies that are right. So, you did a pretty good, good job on that. I won't march twice. So, <laughs> cyberbullying is a type of bullying that can be anything from text messages, email, and instant messenger. So, it's any kind of technology, that's what's going on. It generally looks for victims who are quiet, fair, and honest, people that, you know, aren't going to speak up, they don't think, things like that. It can cause a great deal of um, psychological damage, obviously. Um, and it makes kids uncomfortable in their own homes, and they feel that they can't tell anyone, just like Ryan's story. Mm -hmm. So that's very true. What can we do about it? Um, if we're using this in schools, because this does happen in schools, we use technology, we're in computer labs, avoid answering bullies, don't answer them back, don't you know respond to their comments. Document what bullies are saying. As teachers, we need to document it, turn it off, look at it, keep it in a file. Um, block accounts if necessary. So if at home or if they're abusing internet policies at school, block their accounts. They'll have to find it on their own time. Educate others about cyberbullying because that's important. And just keep an eye on kids while they're giving them pri and but give them privacy. Don't stand over their shoulder and look at them and wait for them to do it. Just keep an eye out and be aware of it. At home, this happens a lot. This could be physical bullying, sexual bullying, and it must be controlled at home before we as teachers can try to take it on at school because they're coming to us with who knows what's going on at home, and we're trying to stop them, but maybe they're acting like this because of the abuse at home. Um, if a child hits a sibling at home, the abuse sibling, obviously, this is an example, and they said they're going to go tell the parent, the parent's going to scream at them, but more than likely, the sibling's going to get mad because they got in trouble, and they're going to, you know, take it out on the sibling before. So they encouraged um, parents not to really... Uh, Discipline them like that, they said, does it hurt you? They'll say, does it hurt you? Did it? Did this happen? And it's more effective, and the bullying stops more than if they would uh, like address them, put them in punishment, things like that. Um, and that's what this says. Um, this is a study I did in my paper, and it's the identification of school bullies by survey methods. It's um, by Cornell, Sears, and Cole. And it was a qualitative stu study because it was um, done during a small group in Virginia, and it was an effort to identify school bullies and to find where it was most, where it was most identified in the school. Um, its overall purpose was to see what the correlation was between um, individuals' view on, or definition of character of bullying, and it's do, done through surveys and things like that. And um, it identified the different types of bullies, which would be self-reported and peer-nominated. That's kind of what we were talking about. If I'm telling you, yeah, I'm a bully, or if peers are saying in this survey that they did, um, hey, you know, do you do this, do you do this? And that was the difference there. And the question of the survey was, can it rely on peer nomination and student self-reports to identify bullies? Is this a successful way in schools to do this? Um, these were some of the research questions they did. I won't go over all of those, but um, that's what they were for. The population was 581 middle school students, and it was mixed between all the grades in the, in the suburban area. Um, they were 10 to 14 years old, and the grade breakdown um, was pretty much even between 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Um, this was the ethnic and race um, breakdown, and I thought this was interesting because they included this and kind of to see if it happens more to other people and whatnot. And um, this was interesting. 30% of the students qualified for free or for reduced lunch. And this is the sampling that they did. They did the survey I mentioned before. They talked to school administrators, things like that. Um, and the self-reported questionnaire that we talked about earlier just assess, assessed all the types of bullying, the physical, the verbal, the social, the whole thing. And the peer nomination forms, were it was the same thing, but it was done two weeks later, and um, it, it did the same thing. Um, this was another study I did, and it was a police measure and safe school survey, and it was trying to find the correlation 
between um, self-concept and things and schools and bullying. And it was um, in an urban school. Um, it was a little different in the breakdown of what the self-reported and the peer-nominated show. I found that kind of interesting. The genders, 62% were males, 18 were females that were considered bullies. So there's a huge difference, and that supports the Department of Federal Safety's breakdown. And again, the breakdown of, of grades is pretty even. Um, this was so students would know about bullying in the school. This supposedly reduced a great amount of bullying in this urban school. They didn't mention the school that they did it in, but they said it was tremendous. And they realized what they were doing, what they were considered, and it really helped the students. And the surveys were anonymous, so the students weren't intimidated. It got them to answer honestly, and it helped identify the problem more. Um, this was another one I did. It's a sticks and stones may break by bones. And this was, again, another study that we, I did um, to see the correlation between emotional effects. Um, the results were often reluctant. The victims were often reluctant to go to school, the survey found. They claim they feel sick a lot, they act afraid of meeting new people, and they have a sudden drop in grades. So the conclusions to this, many of these victims fear being bullied the next day so they don't come back to school. How do we teach bullying as teachers? We can design the project around your subject matter so you can incorporate it in your English classes, in your history classes, whatever you're teaching. And it should be open for discussion and positive. And there's um, define the bullies to students. You can use these surveys in your classrooms. They can be anonymous. Just make it open to students so they know, know what it is. Overall solutions. This is um, the Virtues Project. I know we talked about this in class, and Mantoon uh, Middle School uses it, and it's also a character education program. And hopefully it you know, helps create a total environment and a caring and respectful relationship among both, uh, among both teachers and students, and it's really positive reinforcement. What it does is it just encourages these virtues, encourages positive effects. Um, teachers could also create various activities to address bullying, like role play. You could do situations and kind of see the class, how it feels. Discussions and journal writing. Journal writing is pretty good because it's informal writing. It's um, not necessarily the students are going to see. You can maybe see if there's a problem within your classroom because you, the teacher, are the only one that's going to see it, usually. Um, we can be aware of bullying so we can address classroom issues and student problems at a more individual level. Um, and bullying should be addressed as early as possible in school-aged children, and issues and awareness should take place through formal education. So, um, These are just some anti-bullying policies that I found. If you wanted to look at those, those are also on the um, USDA website. And these are my references that I used.